Well, thank you for having me on your seminar series. Um, the timing is very fortuitous with the acceptance of my PhD student's paper. So I thought I'd introduce you to the world of cyanobacteria and particularly how cyanobacteria changed the world. What you see in the background of uh, this photo of me is the region in the Pilbara in Australia, which hosts some of the earliest life forms. And the flask and the rock kind of indicates what I'm trying to balance in the projects that I am undertaking. So if any of you looked me up, you would see that I've mostly concerned myself with cyanobacteria and their toxicology in my PhD in South Africa. And then I started moving into the environmental realm and particularly uh, looking at cyanobacteria from the terrestrial realm and also that live in the roots of cycad. And this photo is a photo of me in India on our last field trip just before the corona um, epidemic really took off. And we were studying some of the oldest rocks in India. And um, when I came to Germany, I was starting to go into the more environmental research. And this wonderful opportunity came up from the Schwerpunkt Programme 1833, which shortly is building a habitable earth. And they wanted to bring together people from three different areas. Those are used to looking at how the earth came together. So the early mantle and how it made rock. <laughs> and what was the composition of this rock? And then how did this influence um, the origin of life? Or how did we come to be based on what we had as building blocks? which is how I became a geobiologist. <laughs> and I thank Eric for helping me with this photograph. <laughs> um, whereby we try and study the signs in old rocks to understand how life evolved today. So today we are going to go on a little time travel back in time in our DFG funded telesella um, to look at some of the oldest rocks and the evidence of early oxygen and oxygenic phototrophs. And then I am going to take you through some of the proposed concerns that limited the spread of cyanobacteria initially. And today we're just going to look at the salinity stress and potential iron 2 toxicity as well as oxygen stress. And then we can go home and have a beer to celebrate Nick's birthday. And I always loved this. The first, when I was first here in Germany, everybody was always so excited to go home because it's fire oven. And then I learned it's just the same as home time. <laughs> but it still holds a bit of wonder for me. So if we go back in time, you automatically start thinking of the earliest signs of life as in the form of fossils. And you think of the dinosaurs, and then you go a little further down here to the uh, trilobites. And this gets us way back in history to 542 million years ago, which for our purposes is not far enough because we want to go into this period before the Cambrian. In other words, we want to visit the pre-Cambrian. However, if we go further and look at the Geological Society of America, and they've got this um, time scale that's freely available, they at least suggest that the pre-Cambrian in this last column here took up some more time than on the previous representation but you again see that about 400 million years are squashed into one column versus the 541 over these three. So you can go and look at a more um, graphical representation by the German Zeit newspaper, which shows at least a more realistic stretching out of time. And we see over here is again the, pre, uh, the Cambrian and where we want to go to is a little further down the bottom. The same can be said if we go and look at plants, which are even more difficult to study because uh, they don't have rigid skeletons that are easily preserved in the rock record. And again, we are looking at the time at about 2,600 uh, million years ago, where we have some preserved organisms and stromatolites. But again, this is so far back in time. It's not a really good graphic to show the actual age of the Earth. The better way of representing this is to do a linear uh, display. And now you can see that the Cambrian period that filled up our first uh, illustration really only takes up this last 542 million years. And if we go back further, we see that for approximately half of the Earth's existence, there was no free oxygen in the atmosphere. There was some oxygen available, but possibly only in localized oases, 
but it wasn't in the atmosphere. So we still had a slightly reducing atmosphere. And at this point in time, there was this gradual increase over a geologically relatively short period to where we reached the 1% um, O2 of today. So it was at about 0.2% O2. And the general acceptance is cyanobacteria did this. That's it. It is known that cyanobacteria oxygenated the Earth's atmosphere at this period in time. Gradually, more and more evidence has suggested the picture is not so complex and that there are signs of oxygen being available and some sort of phototrophic growth before the great oxygenation event. So in order to get a better picture of the history of cyanobacteria and the conditions in which they live, one has to travel back in time. And unfortunately, it's a bit too far for the telesil to go, but we can at least go and look at current day rocks that are preserved in our current Earth. And for those of you who are not rock scientists, and I must admit I wasn't one until I got involved in this project, there are three basic categories of rock. There are the igneous rocks, so solid lava and magma that solidify. Then we have sedimentary rocks, which are rocks that form gradually from things layering down on top of each other. It can be ash, it can be sand, it can be dust, it can be bugs growing and something lands on top of it, but you gradually build up levels. And then you have metamorphic, which is a large proportion of the rocks we have today, whereby either sediments or igneous rocks get squashed together and half melted and then they re-solidify or they shear against each other and then there's changes in temperature and in composition and this then alters the record that was preserved in the rock and some of the best uh, places to study early life are in the areas where there are cratons because these solid uh, lava shields sort of act to protect any sediment that formed on top and allow one to uh, study these better preserved sediments, not something that has been twisted and torsioned and damaged. So one of the first places I went to was in Pilbara, Western Australia, where Martin van Kannenblonk introduced me to some of the earliest life forms. One of the most uh, well known are the Tumbiana stromatolites. And this ruler is stretched out for one meter in height to give you an idea of how large these solid structures are. And a stromatolite is a, a community of organisms that exist in layers that result um, in the formation of a carbonaceous layer on top of the organisms. And then they grow through it and then you get solidification again and it continues and it gradually builds up this giant solid mushroom of layers of different microbes. There are still living stromatolites around today. Some of them are in the Bahamas and the, probably some of the most well-known are in Western Australia in the hypersaline Hamelin Bay, but they are not anywhere near this size. In addition to just the stromatolites that indicate that there was some sort of phototrophic life, possibly cyanobacterial, we also see signs of layers of sand that have been put on top of each other in a shallow water environment. And we also see preserved ripples that also indicate sort of gentle lapping water. Um, and this was then preserved as well. So we don't just have a sign of life. We also have environmental indicators of the environment in which they were found. Um, another part of the uh, Pilbara contains the Dresser Formation, which is more of a hydrothermal uh, vent system in a non-marine setting. But even here, we find signs of rippled sandstone and a little stromatolite growing here. This is a $1 coin. Here, the layers were more a volcanic ash. Um, then we also have the 3.4 giga year old stromatolites in the Sterling Pool Church in the Pilbara Craton. And again, we can see here that there are layers growing over sand and rocks and granules. Um, and this is just a graphical representation of the images on the right. In addition to which we see indications of sort of shallow water marine environments that were allowing stromatolites and other biological entities to grow. Another uh, very well-preserved uh, region of or example of early life during the Archean period is to be found in South Africa in the Barberton Greenstone Belt as you go um, 
to the, the border of Swaziland, which has been renamed recently. And here again, you have very well preserved uh, phototrophic map where you can see depending on the grains and the way it is arranged that it was either in a coastal floodplain or in an intertidal region or a slightly more supertidal deeper area. And what was characteristic about this is that it formed these tufts, which are quite common in um, other deep marine areas where we've had uh, cyanobacterial mats, such as Lake Frixel in Antarctica. And we find them in Tanzania and even find it in your flask in the lab if you leave your cultures and don't stir them. And this uh, Moody's group with the, this extensive sand area stretches for kilometers on end and suggests that it was a shallow water tidal region, um, possibly marine. In addition to the signs of phototrophic life, it's um, well-preserved desiccation cracks, whereas, you know, if mud dries up, then it forms these weird little hexagon patterns. And then in the fossilization process, quartz forms between these uh, solidified bits of mud, and you can preserve the desiccation cracks. Um, there's also preserved signs of uh, cross bedding, which suggests some sand and tidal movement, um, transverse sections of riffled, uh, indicating shallow water environment, as well as erosion channels that you might be familiar with if you go to the beach. The most recent discovery was of 3.7 million year old microbial structures in the Isua greenstone belt in Greenland. And why this was unusual is most of the rocks there are metamorphic. So they've undergone a lot of uh, shearing and pressure. And normally it would not preserve any of the original rock or anything that was in that environment. But it appears that part of the sediment structure was preserved within one of these uh, metamorphosed rocks. And it appears to have uh, correct chemical signals of a marine environment. And it has these characteristic uh, stromatolites. And why it's quite convincing is that it's, it's more sloped on one side than the other, which is generally suggesting that there would have been a bit of stream coming from this side and then sand gets deposited on here. And this is a very characteristic uh, structure for a stromatolite. So if we summarize this in a timeline, focusing this time only on the Archean and early Proterozoic, we see that before the great oxygenation event here at 2000, well, 2,400 um, million years ago, that there was clear evidence of phototrophic mats in addition to which in some places there are indications of oxygen being present. And they know this by uh, different uh, forms of metals of the rare earth element series that have uh, various stages of oxidation. And if you find them preserved in a way that they were exposed to oxygen, they would then think that there was oxygen around during the uh, fossilization process. So from the geological side, there's quite a bit of evidence that there was something happening before the GOE. If we then go to the biological perspective, it's also difficult to actually, you know, go back in time, find a bug and bring it back to your lab. So the next best thing is to look at the genome and try and find out which are the oldest modern day ancestors that we have. Obviously, you're assuming a continual timeline of cyanobacteria from when they um, evolved till today. Um, however, by studying all of these genomes, you are able to get a good feel of a core set of genes and identify the root organism. And even before these genome studies were conducted, everybody was quite convinced that Gloeobacter, a unicellular freshwater cyanobacteria, was the original root cyanobacterium. And these studies have been able to bring the cyanobacteria back and constrain the evolution to about 2.7 giga years ago, which coincides quite nicely with a lot of molecular studies done particularly by Tancadona of Imperial College that have suggested that PS2 was clearly evolved before the GOE. And in fact, the ancestor of um, the PS system was already earlier and this week, he released their last paper, which suggests that the photosynthetic water oxidation originated closer to the origin of life and biogenetics. 
that can be documented based on phylogenetic and phylogenomic species. So this is a very exciting area to be working in right now, but it all is pointing towards the presence or the possibility of phototrophic organisms and phototrophic mats um, before the great oxygenation event. So what did it look like in the Archean? Well, it was rather different to today. First of all, the sun was a 75% um, luminosity, so it was weaker than it is today. There was no free oxygen, so there was no ozone layer. So there was quite a lot of UV radiation. Um, it was slightly or reducing, so it had a lot of uh, volcanic uh, gases being emitted into the atmosphere, mostly nitrogen. We had some methane, hydrogen, and CO2, and the estimates of CO2 range quite considerably, and this is still one of the areas of active discussion and debate. The ocean was anoxic, iron-rich, and um, the salinity is considered to be roughly what it is today, and the pH was also, it's very hard to find a kind of geological proxy to confirm the existence of these parameters. Uh, a recent review by Katlin and Zahnlich clearly show the ranges of CO2 that could possibly have been there, as well as methane and nitrogen we see was consistently high and we can see that oxygen clearly wasn't here before. So based on this, we wanted to start setting up simulations in the laboratory to try and get a feel for how the organisms that produce oxygen would have fared in an anoxic environment. The question then comes in, well, what cyanobacteria do we use? And I mentioned briefly earlier on that there was a study done by several scientists, but the one I took up contact with is with Patricia Sanchez Baracalo, who's been instrumental in helping me decide on which organisms to actually use in our simulations. And the first thing you'll see when we take a look at the basal strains later on is they're not your typical lab strains because they're not easy to work with. But uh, we tried to focus on just looking at unicellular strains in the basal lineage for our first study. However, we found they weren't quite so robust under our test conditions. So we ended up taking our standard Gloeobacter violaceus, which is right at the bottom. And then we took another cyanobacteria that's often been considered an early Earth um, ancestor, Crocociliopsis thermalis. And the uh, interesting thing about Gloeobacter violaceus is that it has no thylakoids. So it has all its photosynthetic uh, apparatus, this is the phycobilisomes, uh, PS1, PS2, are all on the cell membrane. In addition to which, it also has to have space on the cell membrane to handle the entire carbon concentrating mechanism. So the carbonate uptake, the CO2 mechanisms, are also all situated on the cytoplasmic membrane. Um, Crocociliopsis thermalis is cryptoendolithic, and this means it's an organism that can live on a sand rock but bury itself down, or in a sand level, if it's too bright, it can actually dig into the sand, and you'll see a green rind further into the sand or in the rock. Um, it's also a UV resistant, it's been up to the European Space Station and survived. Um, it's known to be able to tolerate salt to, to a degree, and heat, and bright light. And here you can see a fluorescent image um, showing the cytonemin that it actually produces on the outside of the cell. So using these two, we wanted to investigate whether freshwater unicellular cyanobacteria that presumably evolved on um, land in a freshwater environment could have survived a washout event into a delta system and eventually the open ocean. So we studied not only cyanobacteria growing on a pseudo mat on sterile sand in a petri dish as indicated over here, we also looked at them in a, a culture vessel. So bear in mind these culture vessels have ventilated caps so this continual gaseous exchange into the flat and we have quite shallow cultures to maximize the gaseous exchange from the liquid and the um, into the atmosphere and back again. So firstly, we looked at oxygen production, and I'm only showing you the Gloeobacter one here because we were quite amazed to see the levels of oxygen we get as we go through our little mat here under our 
Archean atmosphere, which was then at elevated CO2. And we at that stage didn't work with zero oxygen, largely because I didn't, I wasn't convinced the cyanobacteria would be content. Um, so we had it then at about 600 ppm oxygen, which was at the upper range that would still not have inhibited the mass fractionation of sulfur. So you could still have had your uh, Archean signatures without um, too much oxygen affecting them. And if you compare it here to our present atmospheric level, we also see we get a lot of oxygen being made, but when we have it in a zero background, we see that we're exceeding our current 22, depending where you are in the mat, um, quite a high level of oxygen being produced under the freshwater conditions. Under brackish conditions, it didn't, wasn't as active, but we could still record oxygen being released. So in this image from the salinity study, the solid bars represent our current atmospheric levels and they are control cultures. And this gray represents the uh, standard environmental levels of dissolved oxygen in the media. The control is the same as the BG11, the fresh water, but when you have additional salinity, there's a slightly different amount of oxygen being dissolved. So you have to always adjust for that. But when you then go and look at it, you see that the Crocus City Opsis showed reduced oxygen production under the uh, elevated CO2 and um, reduced oxygen, whereas the Gloeobacter didn't seem to show a huge difference in the amount of oxygen being produced for chlorophyll. But when we went to look at the gas exchange with the CO2 that's being taken up by the organism, not the oxygen being released, we didn't see a huge difference in our control when we increased the salinity of uh, Crocus sidiopsis thermalis. However, when we had it at its elevated CO2 reduced oxygen atmosphere, we see that under fresh water, there was quite a significant increase in the amount of CO2 it takes up. But the minute we increased the salinity, it dropped down again. So we did see that there were issues. However, whatever occurred, even if the cyanobacteria was washed out into the ocean, it was still able to continue photosynthesizing. And that would be a key point which would allow it time to adapt to increased salt conditions. The Gloeobacter was never happy in the sea, the ocean or the marine media that we used. But we see here that under elevated CO2 reduced oxygen, we do find an increase in the freshwater environment as to the amount of um, CO2 it's fixing. Um, but of course, this gets reduced with increased salinity. So the key take home point from these two ex uh, experiments was yes, salinity is affecting it to a degree, but most importantly, it could still photosynthesize at increased salinity levels. So uh, what was interesting is that we saw that the chlorophyll A content for biomass decreased with increasing salinity, and this is something that we can go into in future studies. Um, and I mentioned the salinity slowed the growth by chlorophyll A. The O2 release decreased under Archean simulated atmosphere. The control gross photosynthesis for chlorophyll A was similar with increasing salinity, but under the Archean simulation, it increased in the freshwater media. What was interesting, and I didn't put up here, is that the glycogen content um, in, uh, decreased under both atmospheres with increasing salinity. And we suspect it was using this glycogen to make um, sugars to triolose specifically to uh, protect itself from the increased salinity in the environment because C. tamalis can uh, synthesize triolose, whereas Gloeobacter cannot. The Gloeobacter violaceus, our little root cyanobacterium, showed that increasing salinity significantly reduced the growth rate in biomass accumulation, and the chlorophyll A content for biomass decreased with increasing salinity. So this seemed to have been maintained. The O2 really significantly reduced with increasing salinity for both atmospheres, and the gross photosynthesis was also significantly reduced with increasing salinity. What we did notice with the Gloeobacter is that we had higher respiration rates. Uh, the gross photosynthesis was difficult to measure in the gas exchange machine because we're often measuring in the error 
range of the machine. So it was really difficult to know if you were just getting a blip in the measurement or whether it was a real result. So we need to maybe move on to using stable isotopes to better quantify the carbon uptake within this organism under elevated or Archean um, CO2 levels. And then finally, with the GVOLACEs, the protein content increased under both with increasing salinity, which was also unexpected and could be pursued in further studies. So now we've made it down the lake and we hit the ocean. So then the next question is, could they survive in this Archean ocean, given that there are reports of um, iron 2 toxicity? And this was the subject of the paper that was released on Tuesday uh, by my PhD student, Achim Hermann, who has spent a lot of time optimizing photosynthetic studies in anoxic environments. We wanted to see how we could reconcile these two concepts. So one is the extremely strong evidence from the geological record that there were areas of intertidal zones that had mats, possibly cyanobacterial mats, and evidence of oxygen from the geological signature that we could see. How could we reconcile this with the iron 2 toxicity hypothesis that had previously been suggested in the literature? And our concern was that in a closed system, with a single injection of gas, you're not going to be able to really represent or um, simulate something that's happening in a changing environment with constant gas exchange. We also were not so happy with a 24 hour life regime because the cyanobacteria are diurnal and have the circadian clock. And particularly with respect to photosynthesis, they use the nighttime to repair all their photosynthetic machinery. So yeah, in addition to which they, the studies had used a more modern strain and the cyanobacteria had not been acclimated to the conditions, which in this closed bottle system, which was the standard way of doing these experiments is hard to do. So we looked at taking two of the marine basal lineage strains and establishing an experimental system whereby we could investigate this paradox. And we chose Sud Anabina 7367, which is a filamentous marine strain, and it's got an extremely large genome of which it doesn't always express everything. And Silicococcus 7336, which is a unicellular marine strain, and it also has a very large genome with a lot of uncharacterized, unknown open reading frames. Both of them produce a lot of phycoerythrin, and the Silicococcus is always generally brown. And the first thing we did was to optimize our culture conditions to make sure we weren't exposing our organisms to too high a light stress. And Achim designed the experiment in such a way to expose flasks of the cultures to different intensities of photosynthetic light and measure the ratio of the carotenoids to the chlorophyll A. So if the carotenoids uh, start increasing, we know that the cyanobacteria are undergoing a bit of light stress and we need to take a lower light intensity. We wanted to get as high a light as we could because we needed the biomass to do our experiments. So it was one of these balancing things. You know, ideally, you'd probably try and grow it here at six, which is what we do in our culture collection. But for experiments, you really would like your, double, your, your biomass to increase at a more rapid rate. So what we have here is the different light intensities. And on this time point, he is showing you here what the chlorophyll A carotenoid A ratio was and has an image of the flasks at the bottom. And we ended up for both of these strains working at roughly the, the 20 um, ppfd or 20 micromoles photons uh, per meter squared per second. But it's this sort of optimization that's essential to make sure that the results you get down the line aren't an indication, a stress response from your organism, but actually what you want to find out. We then decided to repeat the experiments conducted previously in the literature with a single injection of gas, but we were on a day-night cycle um, versus an open culture system. And I need to take a pause here and give a shout out to the company um, GS Glovebox that's down the road here in Karlsruhe. The salesperson's face when I explained to him that I wanted to grow oxygen producing organisms in an anaerobic workstation was quite something to behold. And they took an awful lot of pains and trouble to actually modify an existing um, industrial workstation for us and our use in our lab. 
They established bolts on the top here so we could put a light array up on the top here. They introduced a CO2 um, monitor and feed so that we could change the CO2 levels in the cabinet. They took out the carbon filters so that we didn't take everything. They did an amazing job. But this meant that we basically have an Archean cabinet. So we could then use our standard culture flasks that have ventilated caps in this environment as well, just like you would normally do on the shelf in the lab. And it meant that it was more feasible to see what exactly was happening in cultures with this continual release of oxygen into the environment being diluted in the headspace of this large workspace station, and also allowing continual replenishment of CO2 um, and eventually carbonate in the, the media. So these were our two models. So every time you see a solid closed uh, symbol, that is the closed bottles, and the open symbols represent the ventilated flasks, and this is just our control outside in the normal um, current lab conditions. You can see immediately that the control cultures weren't so happy in the closed culture, although they did end up matching with our normal ones in the lab. However, the ones with elevated CO2 in the anaerobic box were growing at a higher growth rate. We then added iron 2 and immediately in the closed system, you see that with 20 and 120 and up to 600 micromolars iron 2, there's a reduction in growth. If you then look at the amount of iron 2 in the media, studying using the pyrazine assay, um, you see that immediately with the lower two concentrations here that start recovering, the iron 2 has been uh, oxidized, and then the cultures can get going again. With the 600 micromolar iron 2, it took a long time before all the iron 2 was oxidized. If we look at the open culture system, on the other hand, these are the dotted lines here with the open symbols. We see that both the 20 and the 120 micromolars iron 2, which is approaching the concentration of the Archean Ocean, or what is thought to have been the concentration of iron 2 in the Archean Ocean, that we don't see a huge difference in the growth rate. However, with the 600 micromolar iron 2, we see it doesn't really take off at all. And this agrees again with the um, oxidation rates of the iron 2 that was added because it very quickly got oxidized and the cells grew happily. With, with the 600, it wasn't um, all oxidized at all. And uh, I'd like to draw your attention here to the fact that there's a bit of a strange green coloration in this flask in the open culture system. Quickly to take you through Sinecococcus, we see a similar situation. Although here the control wasn't happy at all for the Sinecococcus in the closed bottle, whereas in the ventilated system it was able to grow. We added the iron 2 at 20, 120 and 600 micromolars iron 2 and we see that it got oxidized uh, but it still wasn't able to grow for some reason. If we go and look at the open system however, we do see an initial lag in the 20 and the 120 micromolar but the 600 just doesn't take off at all. And if we look at the oxidation rates again, we see that at 600, we have this incomplete oxidation of iron 2, as in the closed system. And here at the ventilated system, we again find this green precipitate. And it was at this point that we started wondering as to the nature of this green precipitate. And we pelleted the green precipitate and compared it to a cell pellet that would have been generated in the control culture at the same amount of time. And we realized this green stuff was much more than it wasn't just attributed to cell mass. And um, Achim pursued this and we then enlisted the help of James Byrne and Andreas Kappler at uh, Tübingen University, then James has since moved. And um, the student Julian saw what then continued and did the Mossbauer spectroscopy for us. And they could confirm that it was indeed green rust. And this is a lattice structure that forms from partially oxidized iron. So it's a combination of iron two and iron three. And if you have a lot of oxygen around, this would be a very rapid process and you would automatically end up with rust. But we were quite interested that we could very reliably with the addition of 600 micromolar um, iron two to both cultures in the open system, end up reliably generating green rust because green rust is one of those 
words that kind of cause a ripple in the geobiology community because green rust has been included in the banded iron formations, which um, are the source of all the iron that we have in the world today, uh, precipitated out of the oceans. Once the oxygen uh, levels reached such a level, the oceans were oxygenated and the iron was then periodically precipitating out. And associated with this um, banded iron formation, in some cases, we have found signs of green rust. We then wondered, in, against the background of the inhibition of growth and oxygen production, whether green rust has a toxic effect. And Achim came up with an incredibly simple and elegant way of studying this. We tested this on suit anabina, and he generated green rust in a bottle. Now that we could make it, it was quite easy. And he purified it and added it to cultures on the same day that the culture would start forming green rust if we added 600 micromolar iron 2 to it. So here we have our normal control. We added 600 micromolar ferric iron Fe2 to it, and it starts forming green rust. On the day it starts forming green rust, we added extraneous green rust to various concentrations to another control function and watch them. And we noticed that these cultures showed absolutely no difference to the control. They kept growing. However, the ones where green rust had formed flatlined. On this day, where it was clear that the cultures were not going to start growing up exponentially, he then oxidized the remaining iron too. So he basically introduced oxygen to the flask and monitored the cultures further and they recovered it, which seemed to suggest that this green rust formation was what was causing problems with the cells. And if you go and look at this under the light microscope, you see a normal healthy suit anabina filament here. This is what green rust looks like when you generate it in the lab under the light microscope. Here on the left are cells to which green rust was added. And you can see that it's in between cells, if anything, the cells seem to accumulate around the rust granules, as if it's a rust party. But if we look at the ones where green rust was formed, we actually start seeing encrustation of the cells, which suggests that uh, there is a link between the green rust formation and the toxicity. And we came up with this proposed mechanism of um, green rust toxicity in cells that are undergoing low photosynthesis or producing low amounts of oxygen, the green rust forms on the cell surface, and this can in time gradually form um, proper rust, iron 3 or ferric hydroxide, but it prevents the cells from growing. And as indicated here, there's a low oxygen gradient and um, a lot of iron 2 in the environment. However, if you're producing a lot of oxygen, you've got this sort of oxygen buffer zone around you. And this would then prevent any of the green rust or um, proper rust or iron hydroxides forming on your cell surface. They're getting formed further away so that you are then not restrained in expanding and growing further. The big question with which I started the study was not just what is the effect of a single addition of iron 2, but what is the repeated exposure going to do? And as we could show that under daytime conditions, all the iron 2 around the cyanobacteria basically get um, oxidized. We wanted to monitor it overnight after a single addition of uh, iron at sort of the level of the Archean Ocean and monitor it once the oxygen levels in the media had gone down from the daytime photosynthesis activity and flatlined through the night. As the lights go on, the oxygen started rising. And here we have it for both uh, suit anabina 7367 and the Sinococcus 7336. And Ahim uh, traced the levels of iron through the day, uh, through the night. And then as the lights went on, he did it roughly every five minutes. And you can see there's a rapid um, oxidation of the iron too as the lights go on. So we knew we had a system whereby the iron too would remain constant overnight. He then diligently came in every night for 12 days and added iron 2 to his cultures once they'd reached zero oxygen. And he sampled them for iron 2 and also their chlorophyll and monitored their growth. And this is quite uh, interesting in that the suit anabina controls without iron 2 grew as we expected. With the addition of iron 2 every night, we see 
there's a reduction in growth rate, but it still is growing very happily and healthily. And it just doesn't be quite the same amount of biomass as the control culture. And in the end, we calculate roughly, I think, 20% reduction in final biomass or a 50% reduction in maximum growth rate. Depends how you look at it. However, the synecococcus was very much inhibited with this repeated addition of iron 2. So we concluded that Suit and Abena could possibly have survived in a tidal um, zone with an evening influx of iron 2, where synecococcus presumably would not have. We then thought we'd have a look at what is the oxygen production in these organisms. It's one thing to say, okay, they're not growing as well. Um, but what is their oxygen under an anaerobic? How much oxygen do they release under anoxic conditions? And what was really interesting when we measured the amount of oxygen being released was that under both the open and the closed growth conditions and the anoxic conditions, so there's no oxygen here, but it's the closed bottle. And here there is also no oxygen, but it's the ventilated bottle. We see that both of them have much higher um, oxygen production rates than cultures grown in our atmospheric uh, conditions of 0.04% CO2, or our current atmospheric conditions elevated to the 0.2% in the ventilated system. So even though we find that they would have had a lower growth rate, we find that with the increased oxygen production, uh, we could have compensated for the amount required to generate enough oxygen to oxygenate the atmosphere. And these are important numbers that can now be incorporated into models that model the flux in the Archean environment. So the take home message of this last paper is that a closed culture system is clearly not suitable for cyanobacteria. That um, oxygen oases could have prevented the iron rust or um, green rust toxicity because by building up this buffer zone of O2, you would not then have green rust forming around your organisms. If you have a lower oxygen producing organism, the green rust could form and it would probably encrust the organism, thereby restricting their expansion. And it's important to bear in mind that O2 production would have been higher in the Archean than today for chlorophyll molecules. So this led to our updated tidal um, or theoretical marine oxygen oases, whereby we have the oxygen enriched area here. We have in uh, iron-3 being exported out, as well as iron-2 green rust forming in this sort of gray zone, which would then precipitate down into the deep ocean. At night, we have an influx of iron-2 and possible green rust formation, but rapidly when the daylight gets switched on, um, this would be uh, oxidized and the organisms could continue processing for science. So the question that came out of that and led to the next study was what was the big difference between synecococcus and suit and abena? And here I tasked a master's student, Tristan Ending Miller Blyle, to first characterize exactly what iron uptake is in cyanobacteria, preferably without siderophore influence, because the general understanding is that siderophores arose only when levels of iron in the Archean Ocean were reduced once oxygen was in the atmosphere and it finally all precipitated out during the Proterozoic and finally the um, modern day. So he went to look and he compiled the summary. Iron can enter in various ways through the outside, the outer cell membrane that can come in with siderophores through specific uptakers or they can come in through porins and some other uncharacterized um, mechanisms. And they would then contribute either to the iron 2 pool or the iron 3 pool. If you've got iron 2, it can be taken up most normally by a FIO ABC, an ABC transporter system, or a zinc iron permease, or another process which I just call NRAM. There are the iron 3 pathway, majorly characterized is the FUT ABC system for iron 3. Then there is a, a system referred to the CFTR1, which is the same as the EFEU from E. coli. Um, which is unsure if it takes up iron-3 or if it oxidizes iron-2 to iron-3 in the uptake process. Uh, in Synecocystis 6803, scientists have identified an alternative respiratory uh, oxygenase that's 
seems to be involved in oxidizing or reducing iron 2 in the periplasmic space. And then finally, we have here the XBD, the TONB TBT system, um, which is involved with cider 4 uptake, amongst others. So I said to him, right, as we know in the early Earth, it's known that the POB system was in Luca, so it was around. Everybody says cyanobacteria weren't iron soft because they had access to so much iron too. I said, so let's quantify the expression of POB. And he came back to me and he says, well, we have a problem. And he scanned the genomes of both suit and abena and synococcus 7367, and he could not find POB. So I sent him back. I said, you've obviously missed it. <laughs> I made him look for transmembrane domains. I made him look for everything. He couldn't find it. So he ended up, in conjunction with Joanne Bowden, screening 125 genomes for iron uptake transporters. And while this sounds, you know, you just do a blast and you find something, uh, it's not that simple because the annotation is not the most robust and reliable. Um, the annotation is also often annotated according to the E. coli system, for example, and you don't find it in the cyanobacteria. So in the end, he has manually checked all of these genes. <laughs> he also made use of a program called Fijini, which helps um, look at uh, transcriptomics to identify unrelated uh, transporters. Um, and he, using this, he was also able to find some that he'd missed before. But in the end, he was able to draw up this tree that could identify the presence or absence of iron transporters. And if we go in and look at the basal plate here, we found a very interesting phenomenon in that most of the basal clade up till the acaryochlori do not have POB. Interestingly, they also seem to be a bit patchy on other iron 2 uptake uh, possibilities, such as the zinc iron permeate and NRAM. And there seems to be a, a high presence of these XVBD and CFTR1. So this was interesting. And the first thing I then decided to do is if we couldn't find FIOB, we knew that FATB is constitutively expressed in studies done on synechocystis under both iron replete and iron depleted conditions. So I focused our next uh, study on just looking to see if CFTR1 is expressed and in the same system that Achim set up, with an exposure to iron two overnight, and here it didn't maintain it, it starts slowly getting oxidized. We monitored the expression of CFTR1, and we saw, yes, it was uh, expressed, and it didn't seem to change too much with the addition of uh, iron two. Um, and at the start of day, when the last iron two was oxidized, we see a significant decrease in its expression. So this at least confirms that CFTR1 is uh, expressed in cyanobacteria, or at least in suit anabina. Which then brings us to the next interesting problem. How does suit anabina access iron, especially if it was in the Archean Ocean? We know it does not encode a ton B, so it can't really make use of the cider for transport system. Although this XB, XBD has been associated with direct iron uptake, but not well characterized. It doesn't have the FIO system, it doesn't have an ARTO, an alternative respiratory oxygenase, it doesn't have a ZIP or an NRAM. So it would appear that this organism relies solely on iron 3 uptake. And obviously we now need to take this further by doing studies where we add ferrazine to bind all FE2, so only FE3 can get in, or we add a score base and then can only let FE2 get in and see what is actually happening in this organism. In addition to which, Tristan and Joanne have been diligent working on establishing um, Bayesian trees and are starting to look at the molecular clock analysis as to when these uh, various ion transporters were actually incorporated into the cyanobacterial genomic tree to get a feel for what mechanisms they may have been able to utilize in the Archean. So that's all exciting. <laughs> Then you hear that we've got Joanne on board, and I'm sure you've heard of Joanne's work um, on superoxide dismutases. She's been giving a few talks. 
And we were interested to see if we could extend some of the information that she's been gleaning from the cyanobacterial genomic tree into real action in an organism under Archean conditions. And we decided to focus on the suit anavena 7367. And this is work that she's doing with another master's student of mine, um, Sadia Tamana, who's visiting us from Bangladesh and is proving her work in qPCR. Uh, they have identified three different superoxide dismutases in uh, suit anavena 7367. The copper zinc sod has got a membrane target, so it can either be in the cytoplasm or the thylakoid membrane. The same for the manganese sod. However, the manganese sod also has a truncated reading frame that could allow it to be expressed in the cytoplasm. In addition to which it encodes an iron sod. So we then went further and this time we're actually setting up the experiments with all three controls, but we're only reporting one of them here. We're now not using only our anaerobic chamber that we have here to simulate the Archean. We're doing our controls at our normal and um, present atmospheric level, as well as the one supplemented with CO2 at the same level as in the cabinet, so that we can exclude any results that we see um, being the result of elevated CO2 only. And we are fortunate enough to have another cabinet that we can run <laughs> at the identical conditions, same light, just with elevated CO2 in the one. And we see that when we look at the growth curves, that under Archean conditions, we have a higher growth rate and end up with a higher biomass than the two cultures grown at elevated CO2 or present atmospheric levels. And then we went further to look at expression of the superoxide dismutase under Archean conditions. And we sampled them on day eight while they were sort of in exponential phase and have a pipeline set up now to measure the chlorophyll and get RNA and cDNA synthesis and finally do a quantitative PCR with primers that they validated to target the uh, SODs, the superoxide dismutases. At the same time, we also measured the oxygen to check on uh, optimize when we can sample. And this data still needs to be cleaned up. It's quite new off the press from Sadia. This is not functioned yet, so we need to redo the PEL. I think the microsensor went on strike that night. And um, here we have the elevated CO2. So this is our PEL atmosphere plus whatever oxygen the cyanobacteria are producing. And this one is merely in the anaerobic cabinet with the cyanobacteria producing oxygen. In addition to which we wanted an absolute zero value to compare absolute zero expression of the superoxide dismutases. So we stirred them and 24 hours later just sampled. The reason we don't routinely stir all the time is that the suit anabina filaments are very friable and they can break apart. So we try not to subject them to constant stirring. And Sadia then identified uh, some sample points, essentially two hours after the lights go on, two hours before they go off, two hours after dark, and two hours before dawn. The purple one here is our absolute zero that we decided to take. And she then um, extracted the cDNA and did qPCR, so first sod A, which is the manganese sod, and we see it follows the oxygen curve. We also see that the iron sod follows a similar pattern as well as the uh, copper zinc sod. The copper zinc sod seems to be expressed to a lower level, but how this relates to activity is still not determined. We need to go further and do activity assays. In addition to which we see that compared to the absolute zero, um, compared to the culture and the one that was stirred, we also see that we can get really low level expression under total anoxic conditions. So now the next question is to think of this in the context of the cell as to which of these enzymes are actually being made into protein and uh, how active they are. And we're planning to use native gels to see um, which size uh, enzymes are there and if they're active or not. And hopefully then use this to compare to the different atmospheric conditions. So in summary, for all three of these studies, <laughs> It's been a while, sorry. <laughs> we looked at salinity stress and we said that cyanobacteria with rudimentary sugar synthesis genes in the case of Cetomalis could definitely have made it into the Archean Ocean. And uh, even Gloeobacter without the ability of producing sugars to counteract the osmotic stress of the marine 
environment, um, were able to at least continue in an environment of a brackish nature. Bear in mind that if you're in a tidal environment, um, you're going to be partially subjected to salt water in the day and partially subjected to more fresh water in the day. So you're not going to be sitting there static in this brackish environment all the time. That's sort of just the average salt condition you would be exposed to in a day. So it means that over a couple of million years, Globiobacter may have been able to overcome these problems. Then we had a look at iron 2 stress and we found that cyanobacteria capable of high rates of oxygen generation exhibited reduced growth rates in ferruginous conditions which was compensated by higher O2 release when compared to control cultures. And producing lower levels of oxygen would possibly have been encrusted by green rust, thereby impeding the expansion. Preliminary data suggests that extinct basal cyanobacterial species appear not to have carried iron 2 transporters, and that we might have to rethink how much iron the cyanobacteria were actually taking up under the ferruginous conditions of the Archean Ocean. And finally, looking at oxygen stress, we know that these superoxide dismutases evolved quite early on, on Earth and are apparent in early bacteria and archaea. But we've now shown that the basal strain suit, Anabena 7367, does express the superoxide dismutase genes under anoxic conditions. And this seems to be related to the amount of oxygen in the environment. And on that, I'd like to thank you for your time and patience to listen to me. And I'm deeply indebted to uh, Patricia and lending me Joanne for a while to work in our laboratory and Martin van Kradendonk, who really took a lot of time and very patiently explained the uh, Australian Pilbara outback to me, as well as the conditions in the Barberton area and why, um, what the take home messages that are relevant to my research are. And then Nicole for giving me a home for the last three years and the entire faculty here that's donated equipment for my laboratory. I, I found things. They called me the Gelber Zuck Laboratory. <laughs> and then finally, my wonderful team of Achim, the PhD student, and Kati, whose work I did not have time to present now, and Tristan and Sadia, and then Joanne and me. Thank you very much.